Y'all, would y'all, would y'all allow him just a minute to do something? Come here, baby. He wants to so bad, I can't say no. Slow down, slow down, so don't scrub a knob. I just wish he wasn't so bashful. Isn't that precious right there? Come here, Mom. Okay. Run down there to Mama. That energizer bunny ain't got nothing on him. Yeah. Buckaroos and buckarettes, y'all want to go up? It's more. Oh, look at the crowd going there. Hallelujah. While they're going up this morning, I just want to say thank you for letting that boy come up here. He'd been... He sings at home, he sings at church, and that's the makings right there of a, maybe another a great minister. Music minister, just a gospel preacher, that's, that's where we plant our seeds, brothers and sisters. That's where it comes from, and I'm so proud, so, so proud of him. And again, thank you for sharing that love. I'm used to wearing one of them Garth Brook microphones, and it's broke. So if I get veered off, y'all holler, no chucking rocks, just holler. Okay, we're going to be today in, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 17 through 39. That seems like a lot, but it's not really. But what a message it has this morning, brother and sister. In it's today's times, even though this happened way, way back there, way back there at Mount Carmel, it can still apply today to the multitudes. And uh, I want to go to the Lord. Lord, use me as your spokesman, Father. Let this message come true and clear and let the choice be made today in your precious name, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Let me start up here. Uh, as we begin this morning, I'd like to read you a passage from an article I read online. And it's a true story. This happened. Now, this Y'all see if y'all can follow along and be like this feller. It was Thursday, May the 1st, 2003. That's a long time ago. What, 19 years? 18 years? But... Five days after Aaron Ralston, this is the man I'm talking about, had first entered Utah's Blue John Canyon. That's some big old deep ravenous canyon country. He was going on a 13-mile hike. That's what he did, professional hiker. And, uh, but on his way, he's scrambling through a narrow section of a sandstone lot, and he kind of bumped or knocked over a 1,000-pound boulder. He's going through that little draw, and it rolled and pinched his his arm, it pinched on the points, it pinched his hand and his forearm. And uh, you know what? That's pretty heavy, a thousand pounds of rock on you, and you're pinned and can't go nowhere. And he had supplies with him, though. He had two burritos and three liters of water. After all, it's going to take about a half a day, a little over, to get up there. And now they was gone. He'd been there for a while, and there's virtually no chance of rescue. Unless he did something drastic, he would not make it out alive. Well, he's 27 years old, and he was an experienced mountain climber. And he tried to rig something with his ropes and his equipment to move the boulder, but it wouldn't budge. He tried to chip at the rock with one of his knives, but after 10 hours, with one arm pin of chipping, he'd run out of food and water, and all he had to show was a rock dust, little, little pile of dust. And on Tuesday, day three, he's completely out of food and water. It's getting, it's getting drastic, isn't it? It's getting dire. On Wednesday, Ralston began sipping the urine he had started saving a day earlier. That sounds pretty raw and rancid, don't it? But he's surviving. 
He pulled out his video camera and he recorded a message to his parents. And next, he etched his, he etched his name, birth date, and what was certain his last day on earth into the canyon wall. And he topped that off with R.I.P. He's just about lost hope. Well, on Thursday, now this is the, he'd been out of water. He'd been out of food. Sometimes you go to thinking a little bit or you're dreaming. Well, he had a vision of a little boy running across the floor to hug a one-armed man. Might have been his son, you reckon? Well, he realized he had a hard decision to make, and it was a decision that would mean the difference between life and death. Aaron came to the conclusion the only way he could survive was to amputate his own arm. Ooh, that's pretty raw to me, pretty tough. After breaking two bones in his right arm, he cut through the flesh and the tendons and muscle with his good pocket knife, amputating his right arm below the elbow. He used a first aid kit to backpack in his backpack to bandage up his arm and put it in a sling. Then, on top of that, he rappelled with one good arm 70 feet down the cliff and walked to get help. I can just imagine the turmoil, the pain, the agony that he must have gone through as he tried to decide what to do. That's some pretty tough choices, ain't it? It's a difficult and frightening decision, but one that resulted in life. The decision resulted in life. See where I'm going with this? And some of you here this morning are undecided for Christ. Some of you haven't made the full commitment. Undecided. I'm going to get that in a little bit. You're in turmoil over whether you turn your life over to Christ and live or just remain in your sins and die an eternal death in hell. Bold talk, isn't it? But it's the truth. It is the tribe's God's truth. I want to say that the decision you make is no less of a decision between life and death than it was for Aaron Ralston in that canyon. That day he lay in the canyon with a thousand pound boulder on his arm. And you, oh, you have to make a decision, a difficult decision. Right now you got to decide, brothers and sisters, whether, you, whether you're going to be in heaven or you're going to be in hell. There ain't but two places that you're going to go. There ain't two places, but two places offered in eternal in eternity. And that is the joy of heaven or the damnation of hell. A decision to sever yourself from the false gods of this world or live in a, a decision to remain in your sins and live or die. In just a few minutes, I'm going to be inviting you to make that mess and that decision that I spoke about when we talked about the invitation call. But I first want to share you a story from God's Word. And the Bible tells us that a group of Israelites who were, they were spiritually undecided. Israelites! Can you imagine? They had a decision to make, and it was difficult. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, the Bible tells us that for more than three years, there had been a drought in Israel, and the situation was desperate. Desperate. People were starving. Animals was dying. So the Lord sent his servant Elijah to tell wicked king Ahab. Ahab's caused all this. Oh, there's one of them leaders married to that's no account. Jezebel. I got to watch what I say here. It was a dire situation for the Israelites. He sent them to Mount Carmel. And he kept with all the false prophets of Baal and Asherah. And you see, there was not only a shortage of water, but there was also a shortage of walking with the true God of heaven for the people. Elijah, gee, he, was, he was God's man. He was God's man. Period. No doubts about it. No ifs, ands, or buts. And he followed God. He obeyed God. He, locked, he talked to God. He was chosen by God. Let me get in the scripture here in verse 17. 1 Kings 18, verse 17. And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou the troubled Israel? Are you the troublemaker in Israel? And Elijah said, I ain't troubled Israel, but, but thou and thy fathers have, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. It ain't me, buddy. It's you that turned your back on God. It's you that turned your people into sinful, disobedient, mm, hell-bound hell people. In verse 19, Now therefore send and gather, all me, gather to me all of Israel into Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450 of them boogers. And the prophets of, of 400 others. Oh, 
and they would they, they eat it at Jezebel's table. These all these cats were bad. All these guys and these prophets and these they were leading people straight to damnation. Do we have that going on in our world? Amen. We do. Who do you follow, God or Baal? And Elijah came to all the people and said, "Now get this. How long halt ye between two opinions?" Let's see what it says on there. How long will you father falter between two opinions? I like that part. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if the if it's Baal, if it's Baal and you're bound and determined to go that route, follow him. But the people at that time when he was scolding them, he was asking them, looking at them, they didn't say a dead gum word. Not one. Not one. Hmm. And Elijah came and he said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men strong. This is one prophet against 450 prophets plus extras. And then he says to the people, okay, let's y'all get us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood. That's the ones that are that, that following Baal. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I'll call on the name of my God and Lord, and the God who answers by fire. He's God. He is God. So all the people answered, it's well spoken. Well, you know, that passage, Elijah calls for a decision from the spiritually undecided. A decision to be made. We all have to make it. There's no maybe later. We have to make the decision. What do you want for your eternal life? This morning, this morning, God's calling the spiritually undecided here to make a decision. Why does God extend that call to make a decision? Because the passage we read gives us three reasons why God calls the undecided to make a decision today. And I want to tell you right now, indecision is a deep valley that will take multitudes straight to hell. Indecision. God's creator of the Bible, hell is reality for those who transgress his perfect laws some believe but don't obey i'm telling you some believe in god they quote the scripture but they don't obey what god says they're not committed indecision run to god's salvation not the world's sin because it says in the bible for tomorrow we die anybody here think they're going to get out of this world alive no anybody here going to go to hell are you sure? Are you sure? Maybe someone here, and I'm getting with it today, someone here might be on that balance that they have not taken Jesus Christ as their Savior. They have not committed themselves to God to have that, <coughs> that love and that grace and that leadership while we're down here. Jesus Christ, our Savior, King of kings, our Lord of lords, are those that they call themselves Christians, but they don't follow God. You can slice it, dice it, and cut it however you want to. You're following Baal. You're following the world. And that leads, that's a big old wide road. We've, we've preached that many times, haven't we, on the narrow road. Well, time's running out, y'all. For three years, in this right here, three years, God was patient. Three years. But his patience, as it will, here directly, came to an end from that world, the world of the Israelites. After Ahab instituted Baal's worship back in 1 Kings chapter 16, the Lord sent a drought to the land for three years. There wasn't a drop of water. There wasn't even a smell. No moisture. And, and the people still didn't repent and turn to the Lord. They were starving. Their animals was dying. Boy, tell you what, me being an ex-rancher, cowboy, I can savvy the, the gravity of that situation. You got to have grass and water. You got to have it for your cattle. For anything that lives, it produces something for you to eat. You got to have it. Three years, they didn't have nothing. And they still didn't turn back to the Lord. After three years, the Lord sent Elijah to confront, to meet Ahab face to face in all of Israel. And Elijah came to Ahab's servant Obadiah and he said, Hey, you tell the king. You, you, Tell the king Elijah's here right now, and I want to eyeball to eyeball with him. Face to face, right now. Well, Elijah came face to face with the king and told him to gather all his people 
and the prophets of Baal together on Mount Carmel. Boy, this sounds like a good movie, don't it? This ain't movie. This is real. This did happen. As the people gathered, Elijah pressed one question to their hearts, as I mentioned in the Scripture a while ago. How long have ye two had two opinions? How long has it been since you've had two opinions? How long is this going to go on? And Elijah was saying, how long are you going to sit there and straddle that fence? That's what he's talking about. Any fence riders here? Don't raise your hand. Think about it. Think about it. How long are you going to try to have it both ways? You know, some of the pleasure and some of the niceties that God gives us, the blessings he gives us, but yet when it comes to the other factors, we slip back. We enjoy a little bit of it. We don't keep our word with the Lord. We promise, and then we back up. We promise. It's kind of like somebody in Washington keeps circling back. It's time to decide right now, brothers and sisters. It's time to stop wavering back and forth. It's time to stop limping between those two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. And if you're following Baal, then keep a following him because I know where you're headed, and you do too. We're told that the people didn't answer a single word. Why would that be when they was approached with that? <laughs> Afraid? On the Internet, there's a site called Deathlock, deathclock.com. I ain't going to look it up, but I, they said it was there. And the reason they have it, you can type in your birth date, your body mass index, and they'll help you determine or whether or not you smoke. And enter this information. You click on submit, and instantly a screen appears with your death date. <coughs> and the number of minutes and seconds you have. Anybody want to know that? I tell you what, my time for departure of this earth, my ticket's already up in heaven. And God knows the time. He's the only one who knows the time. But he does know the time. Hmm. I tell you what, that just, I love that when he's talking about this. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was such a thing as a death clock? No. Well, there is but God and the only one who can see it. He's the death clock. In a good way, if we love him. In a good way, if he's our Savior. Every minute you delay your decision for Christ, the seconds are counting down to the day when it will be too late. No mas. Well, the Bible says in Second Peter, chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward not willing that any should perish, and that should all come, we all come to repentance. What a wonderful verse. A wonderful verse. He's not slack in, in, in giving his promises, but what I like here, he says he's long-suffering. But long-suffering means he's giving you another chance. But one day he's going to say, that's it. The line's drawn. The patience is out. And we've had all this time, brother and sister, to rejoice in the Lord. To, to change our lives, to repent from our evil and sinful ways. And if you say you've never been a sinner, you're a cotton-picking liar. We're all born sinners. But I tell you what, there's a way that we can be winners in Jesus Christ. Mm. But, you know, people rarely continue by quoting verse 10. I just quoted you verse 9, which says, But the day of the Lord will come. Mm. Did you see it? It's right there in print. We're reminded how the death clock can run out unexpectedly from the parable Jesus told of the rich fool. Rich fool thought he had plenty of time to enjoy life, but his death clock had run down. That's it. I want you to realize this could be true of you this morning. Everybody sitting up here looking, it could be, it could be true of me this morning. The time could run out. You may not make it to the door. You may make it 10 years. God knows. And he has so gracefully and humbly and lovingly allowed us time to get right with him, to get our people, our family right with him. And now I'm going to shout a praise. I've got a little grandson right here that's getting right with him. That's what we need to do, brothers and sisters. That's the seed that's planted and, and, and sprouting. But we also have to be obedient ourselves. We can always pass this off on everybody. Somebody else should do this. You ought to do that. You know the Lord. Do you know the Lord is what I'm talking about. This is between you and him. 
I don't care how many kids, grandkids, or cousins you got. When the time comes, it ain't going to be between nobody but you and Jesus, you and God. Amen? You may be thinking, oh, I've got plenty of time to decide for Christ. I'm young, and there's lots of things I still want to do. Y'all hear me? Everybody hear me? What's old? I don't think there's any age limit to be old and young. I'm young at heart. I just don't look it unless I'm smiling for Jesus. Besides, people say, I need more time to make this decision. I need, I need to consider it. I want to do some studying first so I can understand it more. I'm going to tell you something, guys and gals. You don't have to understand everything about the Bible or about religion to come to Jesus Christ. You don't have to understand it right now. All you need to understand is He loves you. Our Creator created you, and He loves you. He wants you to come to Him. That's why you hear, come, His hands out. Come to me. Let me, let me carry your burdens. He didn't create you just to have like little tin soldiers to play with. You're his children. That precious baby right there, you want the best her, don't you? Every day. You want to show her love and you want her to know love. My little grandson, I want to show him love. I want him to love. I don't want him to know hate. He's going to know about it, but I don't want him to know it in his heart. And right now, God says, love your enemies. Now, we don't have to ride to town with them. We love our enemies because they are created by, by the Lord also. I'm going to get to something like in a little bit. I'm jumping the gun. Hmm. It's time for you to decide for Christ. And how long are you going to keep running in that state of indecision? There comes a time, and time's running out, brothers and sisters. Why haven't you decided if you have not? I'm just going to be blunt. Anybody, anybody out here that hadn't, why not? Why? If it be God, follow him. If it be Baal, you're in trouble. Is it because you have fears of others? What others will say or do because of your decision to follow God? Your peers, your friends, your buddies, your compadres, your little brothers, sisters, you afraid what they say if you, if you give yourself to God? When the time comes, they're going to be on their own before God, every one of them. It's you now, today, that need to solidify your choice. And obey and love our Lord and Savior. And maybe it's the fear of failure that keeps you from Christ today. Perhaps you feel you just can't live the Christian life because you, you're sure you're going to fall. You're for sure you're going to lay down. You fall. Well, perhaps it's a fear of not understanding enough about the Bible or being a Christian that keeps you from Christ. If you don't understand about being a Christian, don't let that keep you from Christ. You will learn it. He'll show you. Your brothers and sisters will show you. That's why we come to church. The church ain't this building, brothers and sisters. It's us. It's each one of us out here to lift and support and teach and care for and love and show the light of the Lord in us. And when we leave here, it's seen. In spite of your fears, God's calling for you today before time runs out. The Lord not only calls the spiritually undecided to a decision because time is running out, but also because of this. Sincerity alone is not enough. You got that, don't you, Mom? Sincerity is just plain not enough. You must take a step, and you must take a choice, and you must choose God. Elijah laid down the challenge and the problem. We're going to get back a little bit. And the prophets of Baal, they took the bait. Oh, he, he knew what he's doing. God was in charge of it. God was going to show them, the Israelites, Baal, and all the false prophets, how strong he is. How much power he has. How much control he is. They, and they all agreed that the God who answered by fire would be God. Here yeah, we're getting into it now. He would be God. At Elijah's command, the prophets of Baal, the no counters, they went first. They prepared a sacrifice. Get me, brothers and sisters. They laid it on the altar, and they began to call on their God to answer by fire. Because the God of Baal was the God of storms. They figured he could throw down lightning. He could throw down the fire and start that altar burning. They cried and they danced and they jumped up and down and they leaped and they sang, but no answer come. And the Bible says in verse 26, there was no voice and no answer. From morning till noon they cried to their God and no answer come to the false God of Baal. At noon, here at midday, <laughs> I like that. Y'all get that? Because we're talking about the good, the bad, the ugly. All right, 
The Bible says in verse 26, there was no voice, no answer, okay? At noon, Elijah began to taunt the prophets of Baal. He began to ride them hard and put them up wet. He was busy now. And he even made some of them mad and calling on their, their God, Baal, is a false god. Well, we're told they cut themselves with knives and lances, and they gushed with blood. And their crying and dancing and cutting themselves, showed they, it showed clearly how serious and sincere they were. But all to no avail, because they were just spitting in the wind. Their God ain't going to help them, because they were trusting the wrong things, and they were sincere to the false god. Today, all over this world, people have false gods. Not the one God, not the God supreme. And sincerity, they're sincere to it, but sincerity alone ain't enough, brothers and sisters. Here's an old article newspaper, uh, newspaper article from a few years back. You know, this is pretty handy. A French artist, he allegedly, allegedly traumatized by the bombings in Spain and was convicted of trying to run over a pedestrian that he mistook for Osama bin Laden. You can tell how old this is. He made a mistake. Well, and he was ordered to pay $615 for the mistake when they got when he's on trial. The 35-year-old defendant identified as who else in France but Pierre. He was sentenced Tuesday by a court in southern France to a three-month suspended prison term. The man he tried to run over was unarmed, Pierre's lawyer, David Mendel, said. And the client, he said his client was the victim of a hallucination. Well, while driving Monday through Montpierre's historic center, the intended target, a man in his 30s, was able to run from the oncoming car. He didn't get smacked, okay? And the, and the car crashed along the side of a street. If it was Bin Laden, now this is, this is the law you're talking here. This is good. If it was Bin Laden, he would have won $5 million, referring to a reward on the intended victim. But instead, he thought he was the victim in his mind, he tried to hit him, and he didn't win anything. He got fined and put in jail. Okay? He was sincere about what he was trying to do. Insincerity is not worth a flip. And I'm certain this man was sincere in his effort to rid the world of such an evil man as Osama bin Laden. He was so sincere. In fact, he was willing to sacrifice life and limb to kill bin Laden. However, no amount of sincerity could turn that pedestrian into Osama bin Laden. So sincerity alone ain't enough. Do y'all smell what I'm stepping in? You can make mistakes. You can judge what God's talk about judging. Also, you can be vindictive. But if you make the mistake, what, is, what a sinful world this is. Mm -mm. This is get, this, boy, this got me excited. There's only one God who answers. Amen? One God. It's interesting to notice in the Scripture, nobody, nobody said nothing. And that's what gets me. That's what gets me in this story. People knew God. They knew of God. They've heard the prophets talk. They've heard about the story of God. But yet they didn't say, I believe in God. I'm going to follow God. They didn't say cotton-picking word. Now, they're indecisive. They're waiting on the proof is in the pudding. Who starts the fires? Okay? Hmm. This is pretty good here. The Lord responded to Elijah's prayer when he started praying. He not only answered once, he answered twice. Because all the Israelites, they could not get that fire started. They couldn't get their sacrifice going. It didn't happen. Well, how did the people of God respond to, to God who answers? Verse 39 says, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, God, he is God. The God who answers demands an answer from you. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm getting lost in this, but I'm going to tell you what happened. God heard the prayers of Elijah. This is what gets me excited. This is our powerful God, our King of kings, our Lord. He had his sacrifice built, the sacrificial monument, okay? Then he cut up a bull yearling, and he put on there four pieces, I think. And then he says, all you know, if you know it, believers, get out the way. Because they didn't get squat done. And then, when he tells them people, he says, all right, dig a trench around this, this altar. Dig it deep. They did. Then he says, all right, now, fill that wood up there. Get that wood good and high. We got the beat on there. Now, pour some buckets of water in that trench. Pour it on the wood. Pour it on the meat. Get it soaking, sopping wet. And they did. 
And then, then to show the Israelites who did not believe, he calls for God to come down and show his power, show his magnificent ability. Pum, man, lightning come down. It, it caught it on fire. It, everything burnt. It's just like it's supposed to be. The water didn't stop it. God overcome. He started that fire. The altar is was, was perfect. The ditch, the, the, the barricade didn't off, didn't off nothing. It didn't stop nothing. That's our God, y'all. I don't know if I'm just mumbling, but I'm so excited I can see it happening. Yes. Torrents of rain coming down. The people looking and standing in amazement. And it's lit after all this water, this rain, this storm. <laughs> lightning comes down. Fire comes from the sky. He lights it. So not only once, not only once, by fire, God showed his, his magnificence, but the second time by rain. How about that for our God, our Lord, okay? How long you, will you respond this morning to the God who answers? Will you answer these people, or will you remain like they did, silent, silent, and in sin? I can't stress to you enough, today's the day. If you haven't taken Jesus Christ as your Savior, today's the day. You may not have tomorrow. And once you leave this earth, it is just too late. And that's why God has graciously given this, uh, this extra time. When he says in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, the scripture there, he's graciously given us that. God has given an answer to us. He's given an eternal answer for the problems of humanity through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? The Bible says, But God condemneth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we were still I mean, no account sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you, and you, and you, and you, and me. My Jesus, your Jesus, he died for us. And in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, the Christ died, was buried, and then what happened? Rose from the dead. The only God in, could ever do that. Will you say yes to Jesus? Will you say yes to the cross? Because I'm telling you, his answer is the only answer, brothers and sisters. The God who answers expects an answer from you today. He expects it. You ever heard of Forbes magazine? I'm going to share a little something right here that will blow your socks off. Forbes magazine listed 587 people in the world who are billionaires. But you know what? God's answer is the same for all 587 of them. Just like it is for us. In the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, Bill Gates was number one on the list with an estimated wealth of $46.6 billion, which no doubt has gone up. But the answer from God is still the same for Bill Gates. We're told that half the world's population, 3 billion people live on less than $2 a day. You know what? The answer is still the same for them too. Billionaire or poor man? The answer is still the same from God. Beauty, wealth, poverty, sickness, health. Power or prestige can't change the fact there's only one God, one, period, who answers. He's waiting, waiting, waiting for our answer this morning. His answer to you in, the, in the, all the ages is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the answer. Y'all going to sleep, I'm going to come down on that floor. I'm so excited right now. How can you sleep when God is in the house? And hear this word. He wants you, brothers and sisters. He wants you to be that one-on-one -on -one with him. That's your father. That's your father. I'm going to close here real quick. I'm going to tell you the story about an airline pilot who was flying passengers from L.A. to New York, and he asked all the Christians on board to identify themselves. He had been making flight announcements before he asked to show of hands who was on board New Christ. Then he encouraged, now listen to this, then he encouraged every one of those people that raised their hands in New Christ to share the, to the non-Christians on board about their Lord. How about that? We're not even doing that sitting in the coffee shop, are we? This is an airline flight, and people are raising their hands. They know God, and they're sharing God. Amen. Every person on that flight that day fell into one or two groups. Either they could raise their hand and identify themselves as saved, or they could not identify themselves as saved. They were saved or lost. They were heaven-bound or hell-bound. They weren't no sitting on the fence. And I wrote this this morning, Christmas by C.S. Lewis. I found this, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. But if it's true, it is of infinite importance. Amen? The only thing it cannot be 
is moderately important. You can't be lukewarm. God will spew you from his mouth. You've got to be hot for the Lord or cold. That's what he's telling us all this time, brothers and sisters. If you're undecided, if you this morning sitting here undecided to take Christ as your Savior, to have the Lord in your life, that means you're at least considering the claims of Christ because you're here. But being undecided still means being lost. If you don't make the choice, if you don't take the step, if you don't call on God, Jesus Christ, to be your personal Savior, it's lost. If you're undecided for Christ, this moment you're lost. Still in your sins and still hell bound without Jesus. But you don't have to be. You can make the decision right now. And what I encourage you to do, band, come back up here. I want to invite you to take Christ as your Savior. And that moment, that moment right now, brothers and sisters, has arrived in this church, in this service, when you're being invited to say yes to Christ. Lay pastors, elders, come to the front. We had a point of decision, brothers and sisters. Whoever's lost out there, whoever's riding the fence, whoever's unsure, whoever's undecided, we're at that moment of decision. It's today's the day. And when this music starts, I want everybody that wants to make that decision, please come to the front. We're not going to kneel on the floor. I can't do it. But I can sure stand and pray to God and ask Him to be my King and Savior. And we have men, we have men here that will pray with you, witness to God. Witness is your, your desire to be a Christian, your desire to follow God, your desire to have God in your life. Brothers and sisters, if you have a need, please come down. With every head bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to pray this while coming down. Anybody wants to come down? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this message. And Father, I pray in your name that nobody is left, nobody is lost, nobody is lost out. Father, you're so, you're so powerful. The King of kings, the Lord of lords. Father, I ask today that you touch those. Go to them. Father, let the Holy Spirit touch. And they feel you. And they feel that their need now can be met. They can come forth, Father, and ask you to forgive their sins. And ask you to be their King and their Savior. And I ask these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Thank you.